I'm very glad uh, to introduce uh, my old college chicken, uh, or informally, as you know from the Polish lecture, Polish uh, He will speak about the parents of this in S3 and digital connections. Actually, uh, life is full of coincidences. Uh, one of the coincidences. Well, you're not wired up. <laughs> This book, I should say, I tried to read this book when I was learning topology. And uh, Kole Ivanov uh, was a substitute professor in my topology class, which I was taking. And uh, a real professor was Alek Viro. So uh, I'm glad that uh, I learned something in this class. So, uh, so this is the title of the talk. Uh, invariance of links uh, with flat connections uh, in the complement in the complement. So uh, I'll, I'm, I plan to do this uh, talk as follows. First, I will remind some uh, elementary construction of invariance of links that is based on solutions to the young Baxter equation. Uh, then I will spend some time uh, discussing various combinatorial presentations of uh, flat connections, of the moduli space of flat connections in the complement to a link in uh, R3. Everything will be in R3. And then, at the end, I'll outline the construction of invariance of links uh, with flat connections in the complement. So, the other name for this invariance would be, these are the invariance of links with values in the space of functions on the modular space of flat connections. And these flat connections are uh, meant to be in uh, G bundle, where G is simple complex algebraic. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Renat Kashaev. And the paper is almost ready. Uh, maybe next week or so will appear in the net. Um, so first, let me remind the construction that appeared maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, something like this. So this is uh, the construction of invariance of links uh, that is based on linear operators satisfying the uh, young box. So first, let me remind what is the, this equation. So let's fix a vector space and a linear operator acting in the tensor square of this space. Then um, we will say that this operator satisfies the young Baxter equation if uh, well, this identity holds. Here, all operators in this identity act in the tensor product of three copies of the vector space V. Uh, and some obvious notations natural notations, R12 is the operator R tensored with the identity map in the vector space V. R23 is the identity tensor R. And then R13, well, it's R acting in the first and the third copy and identity acting uh, in the second copy. So sigma is just the permutation map. You can write it like this. Okay, so, well, the really uh, the language that I've, I'm supposed to use here is the language of uh, braided monoidal categories and factors uh, between braided monoidal categories, but I just want to use as plain language as possible. So I'll use the language of linear maps and uh, pictures. So uh, this equation can be written graphically uh, as follows. As the first uh, Redemeister move, Say, uh, let's uh, depict matrix elements of our linear operator R in the linear basis uh, in V uh, by this picture. Say, the matrix element 
part A, B, D, C will correspond to this pitch. And this is the definition of the matrix element. So then, if we will use the, uh, the rule of graphical multiplication of matrices, so if you have a matrix represented by this picture, if you have a matrix represented by this picture, uh, well, this matrix maps vector space V into the tensor product of three copies of V. This one maps tensor product of three copies of V to the tensor uh, square of V. And then their composi composition can be written as sum over ABC over intermediate indices. And we will shortly write it like this, just as a graph. I mean, this is a standard uh, sort of way of uh, graphical uh, I mean, strictly speaking, what is written here is uh, composition of morphisms in vector spaces, and it's actually a functor from the category of graphs to the category of vector spaces. But if we will use these notations, uh, we can write the Young-Baxter equation as the third, uh, as the first Rademeister move, and. Uh, Essentially, this is why we can use these linear maps that satisfy the young baxter equation in order to construct invariance of links. So let me state uh, the theorem and define the invariant. So here is the definition of the invariant. Say if you have this uh, knot, the, you can construct the invariant of knots in the following way. Uh, take all the intersections uh, that you have on the diagram of this node, take all the critical points uh, on this diagram. Well, of course, for, in order to have these critical points, you have to choose a direction on the plane of the diagram. And then assign linear maps to critical points and to the um, singular points, to the double points of the projection. And the assignment is the following. Well, to this intersection, we will assign the, our R matrix that satisfies the end box the equation. And then uh, to the critical point, we will assign the identity matrix. To this critical point, we will also assign the critical, uh, the identity matrix. And then to the critical points where the orientation of the link is uh, opposite to this one, we will assign the matrices in this way, where here I assume the composition of the R matrix and the uh, identity matrix here. And uh, to this intersection, uh, we will assign uh, this composition of identity maps and the R matrix, and so on. This one? Yeah. Um, it's this. You should think of well, you sort of do it like this. B oh. A prime B prime A. So to this intersection, you assign the R matrix by this rule. Again, these are the identity maps. And uh, this, is the, this is already defined. So it's sort of inductive definition. I mean, I, strictly speaking, I should have defined this first, this second, and this third. Other questions? Now you, you define this argument in the third line. It uses well, that's what I say. First line, second line, yes, okay. third line. Second line, what you say. It uses the third. Oh, is it? Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I took this from the paper by myself, written in 89. <laughs> I screwed up the... Uh, directions. So anyway, there is a way to define it inductively. 
and uh, the theorem uh, from the same paper, which is uh, uh, says the following: that uh, if you will define this partition function, uh, I mean this sum, uh, then uh, it will be invariant of link, uh, provided that uh, well you can that R is invertible. Actually, you have to put R inverse in the places where you have the opposite intersection, and that transposed R over the first space is also invertible. Um, it's a generalization of the theorem by Turayev, uh, which required the existence of certain matrices. Essentially, it says, this theorem says that you don't have to have anything except the young baxter equation. Everything else is following from this. So, well, there are, I, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's just the idea of uh, how to define it. Now, the main question is how to find such uh, linear maps that will satisfy this equation. And, uh, well, there, is a, there are several sources of uh, such invariants. Uh, first, uh, one can find these so-called R matrices from the representation theory of so-called quantized universe developing algebras of simple Lie algebras. And uh, then, related source is from conformal field theories and here, uh, what I meant is, uh, well, various constructions in uh, braided categories and so on. In fact, uh, there is far more sophisticated language that should be used here, but uh, I shouldn't use it now. So the main message that I wanted to deliver here is that the very basic ingredient uh, from which you can construct all these invariants is a solution to the young baxter equation. You don't need anything else provided that it's not degenerate in this sense, that it's invertible and it's transposed over the first copy of uh, the vector space in the tensor product is also invertible. Yeah, there's a long yeah, there is a long story behind uh, this equation in statistical mechanics and why there are three spaces. Um, it came from integrable systems, and uh, I, I just don't have time to uh, remind this whole story. It's just since I mentioned this name, integrable systems, uh, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, there are many notions in uh, mathematical physics of integrability. But basically, all these notions sort of boil down to a simple fact that uh, the only, basically, uh, we have very few domains outside of integrable systems where we can do something. Um, and uh, topology is probably the most integrable part of mathematics because it's sort of you throw away everything except topological, the very basic properties. So the next, it's, uh, you can see this pattern in, say, in quantum field theories. There's the so-called topological quantum field theories that provide invariance, topological invariance. There are less topological, topological quantum field theories, a little bit more geometrical. They, they provide some geometric invariance. But then there are real quantum field theories that describe real world. They don't provide any invariance. They are supposed to explain the physical phenomena, but uh, there are very few cases when people can say anything substantially um, deep about these theories beyond the perturbation theory. Actually, the next uh, talk will be an example of uh, some recent deep development in the general quantum field theory. Probably one of the few uh, developments uh, in the last decade. I'm talking about important developments. Okay, so <laughs> uh, in real quantum field theory. So um, now the goal uh, of the next minutes of this talk is to generalize this principle that you have the young baxter equation and you construct uh, invariance of links out of it. To generalize it. Uh, for constructing invariants of links with values in the functions 
on the modular space of flat connections in the complements. So uh, first let me remind some basic facts about flat connections in, uh, over the, in the G bundles over the complements. So uh, topologically we think about this flat connection as a group homomorphism from the fundamental group of the complement to a link to our uh, group and combinatorially we can sort of describe such homomorphisms in the following way. So let's fix a projection I will use. I know that Dylan doesn't like projections, that this is too crude and brutal and violent uh, operation on uh, links, but I, so far I don't know how to avoid it, so I will use this old approach. Uh, so, so let's take a link, uh, let's fix its projection uh, to a plane and uh, we have a diagram of a link, of this link uh, on the plane. So I assume that it's a regular projection in the sense that uh, there are no other singular points except double points. Um, and um, the conference, uh, the name of the conference is graphs and patterns, so here we have uh, graphs. Uh, we will think about the projection uh, as a graph uh, with vertices being double points. And also for the reasons that we already saw before, I will choose a direction on the projection plane. And I will say that the vertices of this uh, diagram are critical, uh, are singular points and critical points with respect to this chosen direction. And I will assume that uh, uh, from now on, uh, all these diagrams will be such that this is a simple critical point. Okay, so the diagram is a graph with vertices, double points, and critical points, and the edges of uh, this graph will be, well, the edges of this graph. So now combinatorial description of pi 1. So we choose a base point, uh, and we'll assume that it projects to the left of the diagram with respect to this chosen direction t. Um, then the cycles uh, of in the in this pi one can be drawn in the projection plane as this paths that go around the edges, and. Well, that's a very well-known uh, description of uh, what's this? So uh, this, so we choose standard paths that uh, will go above all the components of the diagram, and then they will go once uh, around the edge of the diagram, and then they go back again above all the other components. So. Um, in this way, uh, pi 1 of the complement is generated by the edges of the diagram with these defining relations um, at the vertices of this graph. So this is a combinatorial description of the pi 1 and uh, it gives naturally the description of the modular space. So now you should attach, a, so if you want to describe gauge classes of flat connections uh, in the complement, you attach the group elements to the edges of the diagram and you assume that these group elements uh, satisfy these relations and then you take the quotient over the uh, action of G by conjugations on these group elements. Uh, the resulting variety is the exactly the uh, modular space of uh, these flat connections. So this is a combinatorial description of the modular space. The disadvantage of this description, uh, I think it's also known as Quindles, and uh, the disadvantage, well, not the disadvantage, but uh, sort of intrinsic property of this description is that it's not local. Uh, these group elements that we assign, they are assigned not to some sort of, uh, local data, but to 
path is from our cho chosen base point uh, around so, so to, to global objects. Uh, if we want to use the same uh, ideology as we used uh, in constructing the invariance from the young Baxter equation, we somehow should have more local description of the of this modular space. Um, Where do I see the word flat? Flat. Well, you can move this paths, and uh, when you move this paths uh, without changing the base point, um, you don't change the holonomy. That's the that's that's the meaning flat. That's the meaning flat. Um, okay, so now another description uh, of the same modular space. Um, I need one assumption in order to do what I want to do. Uh, assume now that uh, it, this is so. So let's assume that the Lie algebra of the uh, of this Lie group is factorizable. In other words, there are two Lie subalgebras, G plus and G minus in G, such that for any x in G there exists unique uh, pair, x plus and x minus in G plus minus in G, such that x is equal to x plus plus x minus, and uh, these G plus minuses, as I said, uh, are E subalgebras. So then, uh, by exponentiating this, we have the open dense subset G prime uh, in G, such that for any G from this open dense subset, there are elements g plus minus, uh, g plus minus bar in the corresponding Lie subgroups in G, such that uh, this any element from G star admits the factorization, left factorization into G plus G minus inverse and the right factorization into G minus uh, inverse G plus. Uh, if G is a fine, if G is a discrete group, if it's, if it's, well, if it's not a Lie group, then you just assume that uh, there is an open then subset of some similar assumptions. Uh, I will be focusing uh, here on the case when G is a Lie group. So, uh, just G admits the factorization into G plus G minus inverse and to G minus inverse G plus. These elements will be different from these ones. This is why I used bar. Just, it's just like matrix, a matrix you can factorize you can do Gaussian decomposition sort of in one order or in the other order. <coughs> okay. So in, for simple Lie groups, this is just the intersection of uh, big, uh, two big opposite blue cells, this uh, G prime. All right. So, um, well, then we do the following. Well, the clean. Um, uh, in the modular space of these flat connections, there is an open dense subset such that for any gauge class uh, in this subset, there is a representative uh, of the following form. So now I'm thinking about uh, gauge connection as a one form, uh, about flat connection as one form. So. If we keep in mind the same picture, a link and its projection on the uh, on this plane with chosen direction t, uh, we can consider a cylinder. So consider a diagram on this plane and consider its pre-image in R3. So you have this infinite cylinder that sort of projects to the diagram, and the link uh, is lying on this cylinder and dividing it in two parts, left and right. So let's choose the support of A minus on the left side. And let's choose, let's choose A. So the claim is the following, that we can choose uh, a representative from uh, almost every gauge class in such a way that uh, A plus will be su supported on the right side and A minus component will be support supported on the left side. So here A plus minus are G plus minus varied uh, forms, the sort of polarized components of our connection. And uh, so I, I, I didn't mean to say. Hmm? 
What? Uh, so it's supported in this in this infinite in the small neighborhood of this cylinder, it's not on the cylinder. So combinatorially, it means the following: if you look at the diagram, so sort of parallel to this cylinder, well, what you will see is say this is an edge of the diagram. The projection goes perpendicular to the uh, blackboard, and if you look from here, you don't see the cylinder; you see the projection. But if if there's a path that is crossing this cylinder, it picks up the holonomy only when it crosses the infinitesimal neighborhood of this cylinder. So, and depending on whether this path will cross the cylinder before the link component will meet it, or after the link component will meet it, uh, it will pick up the holonomy either in one subgroup, G+, plus, or in the other, G-. minus. So, for this, for for a connection that we, for gauge class represented by such connection, uh, let's denote this by x plus e, x minus e. And now these are the local data. We associate it to each edge of the diagram uh, such elements, x plus e and x minus e. Notice that uh, they don't change if you do infinitesimal, if you, if you vary the um, path uh, such that it intersects the edge in different points, because I assume that the connection is supported uh, in the small neighborhood, uh, because the connection is supported in the small neighborhood of uh, this cylinder. So is it clear? Yes? Pardon? Uh, then you will have the old picture. Uh, the quindle, quindles. Huh? One. I, I don't know how to pronounce. Quindles or quindles. Quindles. Yes. Quindles. So uh, it will be clear from this statement. So, first of all, we want to describe the representation of pi 1 in G. So let's, let's uh, relate our combinatorial data x plus minus uh, corresponding to edges and the holonomies along these paths. It's clear that uh, if you have such path, uh, it will cross these walls uh, above the components of the link. So when you go there, you will pick up, well, you should go from the right to the left. When you go along this path, first you will pick up these uh, inverses. Then you will pick up the holonomy around the HE. And here XE is X plus E, X minus E inverse. Then when you go back, You'll pick up the same things as you picked up here with the inverse sign. You'll pick them up just as they are. So the result is that the holonomy along such path can be expressed uh, by this combinatorial data x plus minus uh, in this way. And then instead of quindle uh, relations around each vertex, uh, we will have these relations. Um, strangely enough, uh, these relations, let's see, number four, uh, number two is a window for G star. If you think about X being pair X plus X minus, X plus X minus inverse. So, We don't know what the quantum is. Oh. Is that really part of the No. I, I mean, it's just a relation that we had before. It's the, I mean, when you have the group elements assigned to edges around vertices, and when you have these relations, these are called bundles. I mean, 
this is this is how I understand this terminology. Probably it's uh, Yes. And then G plus and G G star is the following. It's G plus cross G minus, more or less. I'll explain it later. Um, okay, so we have these relations. I should say that uh, these relations have some history. G star is more or less I don't want to go into the details now. It's more or less G plus cross G minus. More precisely, it's some subgroup there. Okay. Right. So if G is simple um, algebraic, well, if G is simple, doesn't matter the rest. Uh, G star is the subgroup in B plus cross B minus, where the Cartan part in B plus is identified with the Cartan part of B minus, such that one is equal to the inverse of the other. Do um, I understand correctly that four means just the same relation but for the crossing with the inverse sign? Forget it. It's confusing. <laughs> uh, it will appear in the paper. <laughs> uh, I, did, I didn't mean to say this. Is this for a negative crossing? Or? No, no, no. It's the same. Re OK. I, can, I know how to write it. The same relations can be written without all these words, can be written as this. x plus minus b, x plus minus a is equal to x plus minus c, d, x plus minus c. So these local parameters that you assign to edges, they look like G star flat connections, combinatorially. But they don't. They're local parameters assigned to the uh, edges. So then there is this strange description of the of this open dense subset in the moduli space as follows. You assign these elements x plus minus e to the edges of the diagram, provided that they satisfy these relations. And then you mod out by the diagonal action of G by conjugations on these um, elements that represent the pi 1. So few remarks about this statement. First, as I already pointed out, this description is local. Now we assign these parameters to the edges of the diagram, not to the paths um, that represent generators of pi 1. And uh, we express the paths, the generators of pi 1, in terms of these parameters in this way. So second, because m tilde is an open dense subset in the modular space, our functions on m tilde Find the function. Well, it's sort of they have the same algebras of functions. What is used to be able to do this local interpretation? What is used about the only thing that was used is that uh, every element of G can be almost every element of G can be factorized in the left. Uh, admits the both factorizations, g plus g minus and g minus g plus. That was the only fact that was used. Hmm? It's important that it's unique. Yes. OK, so this is the local description. And now the next step, uh, well, everybody can guess what will be the next step. I will try to use this local description in order to and then you will return back to the uh, uh, sort of non-local description. No, but you said in order to have a local description you just have the acting where it has this decomposition problem. So um, some other acting.
I cheated a little bit. The, dis the previous description is also local. Uh, in a way, because uh, you fix the holonomy around the edge of the diagram. So, um, the real reason for the introduction of G plus and G minus is that, let me return to this. So, so far let me admit that I hide the real reason for introduction of G plus and G minus. And then, why is there any diagonal part? Um, if G is simple and if G plus is the positive barrel and G minus is the negative barrel, then there is a well there is almost unique factorization. Uh, if you say that G plus has the Cartan part inverse to G minus. That's. But you need simplicity. What? You need simplicity. Yes. If it's not simple, then something else can happen. There is such an option as uh, a double group, Greenfield double. So you, you use this Greenfield double, and it will be absolutely safe. That's essentially, that's, that's where the factorization came from. But. You see, then I would have to mix two subjects, uh, to simple topology and uh, some rather heavy uh, Poisson Lee groups and quantum group theory. So uh, I'm trying to hide the second part. Yes? Just one question. So how do you factorize a diagonal matrix to uh, Excel and XR? You take the square root of it. Square root of it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in the neighborhood of the identity, it's Okay, so um, so now we want to do the following. Uh, we want to represent the same Rademeister move by linear operators, but now uh, we will assign the group elements uh, to the edges in such a way that around each vertex they will satisfy these relations that the flat connection uh, would satisfy. Now. I wrote here the same relations as uh, were in the theory. Say so when you have such intersection, if the, this, this is the element x, that is x plus x minus inverse. So in the previous picture, it was xc, xd, xa, xb. It's uh, more convenient uh, to, in order to write this relation, to say that, say this is a group element, x, this is a group element, y, then this is x left function of x and y, and this is x right function of x and y, provided that we can factorize all these elements as we want. Then this x left is this one, x right and this one is this one. Everybody who knows tracing transformations in the theory of Poisson Lee groups will recognize immediately uh, tracing actions here. Uh, but if we really want to construct invariance in the same way as we did before, but now with this extra data, uh, we will have to have solutions to uh, this young Baxter equation. The, this is the equation for the matrix acting in V tensor V, which is a function on G cross G. And, uh, pardon? No, V is a vector space, some vector space. V is some vector space. Oh, okay, matrix elements of R are functions, so R is the V tensor V valued function on G cross G, where G is our little. Is this? Okay, so R is a linear, well, not linear, it's just, it's 
it's a map from G cross G. To endomorphism of B. Ah, to endomorphism. I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's this. For each x and y, it's a linear map in between zero. Okay, suppose that we know such function. So what we can do now is we can try the same construction as uh, without flat connections. But now uh, we will put the, uh, these G colorings that will satisfy the relations which describe the modular space of flat connections. We will use these new functions R of x, y instead of the old linear maps, constant linear maps R. And we will do the same tricks. And I really don't have time now to describe the, to the tricks in the details. So, but just let's follow this analogy. So then uh, the theorem is that it gives an invariant of link. Um, this invariant of link uh, will depend on the choice of flat connection in the complement to a link. The non-trivial part here will be uh, to prove that this function is gauge invariant that uh, this uh, invariant will be actually a function on the modulate space of flat connections, not just a function of some combinatorially chosen flat connection. So it's, I have to finish this talk in 10 minutes. So I don't want to, I mean, basically, I cannot uh, in any reasonable way to explain how it works. But I can explain what we should do next. So the question, uh, the question that I didn't address here is where to find such R's? How to find, how to find the functions that will satisfy this functional equation? Well, it turns out that the answer is very simple. You can use the same quantum groups, but you should specify the parameter q to the root of unity. This is the answer. So how to construct this uh, r of x, y, um, such that we can, uh, such that they will satisfy this modified Young-Baxter equation, and such that the invariant uh, will be gauge invariant. Uh, such that uh, we can say that this invariant really depends on the point in the modular space, not just on the combinatorial uh, uh, connection described by these group elements. Uh, so we can use the representation theory of uh, quantized universal developing algebra at roots of unity and uh, to explain which particular quantum group and which representation theory we should use. Let me look at the example first. Uh, of <coughs> UQB plus, which is a subgroup in subalgebra in UQ SL2. So it's, well, usually it's considered to be the algebra over polynomials in full formal variable Q, Laurent polynomials in formal variable Q. Uh, it's generated by K plus minus by invertible element K by the element E with defining relation, with the only defining relation that KE is equal to QEK. So you don't see any room sort of for uh, any reasonable geometric object here so far. But, uh, and it's, a, it's well known, it's a Hopf algebra. Uh, but now let's specialize Q to the root of unity. So I assume that, uh, let's pick up uh, root of unity, L root of unity. For some technical reasons, uh, L should be odd and epsilon should be primitive. Uh, well, then it's easy to see from this relation that L powers of K and E are central elements in UQ B+. Uh, this algebra doesn't have, uh, uh, the center of this algebra is 
uh, trivial for generic Q. Uh, but uh, at this particular values of Q, uh, you see that you have a center of polynomial functions in uh, e to the L and uh, k to the L plus minus 1. Uh, this central subalgebra is also a Hopf subalgebra. And essentially it means that this central subalgebra in our Hopf algebra is the is isomorphic to the algebra of polynomial functions on the Borel subgroup B plus, well assuming that by Borel we understand this uh, it's Borel subgroups in GL2. And the isomorphism is given by uh, this yeah. So this Hopf algebra truth of unity can be thought as uh, a bundle of algebras over the spectrum of this center. In other words, over the group B e plus. So you already see that sort of the, uh, there is no, well, it's, it's not clear from this example what I want to say, but uh, that should be clear from this remark. So if you will take U, uh, QG, will specialize it to a root of unity, then it's known, uh, and these are the papers by uh, Katz, De Cancini, and Francesi, that uh, first, well, uh, the elf powers of these elements are central. Second, uh, they generate the central subalgebra, which is isomorphic to the algebra of polynomial functions on this uh, so-called dual pass only group. And I consider uh, this as an algebraic group, so C is just the algebra of polynomial functions. Uh, this is the Cartan part of the uh, elements. Does it make a difference whether the value in the center is zero or non-zero? Does that split the two classes? Uh, this, well, it's the question, I, I understand the question as follows. Um, you're asking about uh, irreducible representations of this algebra. Yeah. So, uh, general construction of irreducible representations is that when you have an algebra and uh, the center of this algebra, first you pick a point uh, on the center, on the spectrum of the center of this algebra, and then, uh, so if you investigate what, uh, you investigate the corresponding quotient of the algebra, and sometimes it's reducible, sometimes it's irreducible. Uh, the statement about this algebra, well, this algebra is finite dimensional over its center. So the statement uh, over about this algebra is the following, that for generic points on the spectrum, in other words, for generic points on G star, the corresponding representations are reducible, but if you fix some other central elements, you will get an irreducible representation. So, uh, over generic point of the, this is not the whole center of the algebra, There's, the center is bigger than this. But if you will fix, uh, <coughs> the spectrum of the whole center is a finite cover of G star. So if you fix a point on G star, if you fix a point on the cover, then you get an irreducible representation. Everywhere except uh, some um, some variety of, uh, so that is outside of this uh, generic uh, point, the set of generic points. And the identity in this group belongs, it's the most singular point. If you will study representations uh, uh, where e to the l is 0, f to the l is 0, and k to the l is 1, this is the most complicated representation theory of this algebra that we can imagine. So, um, uh, this, well, I really don't have, so this it's a very beautiful uh, representation theory that sort of blends the uh, geometry and uh, uh, the geometry of the group G star. And the G star is not just a group, uh, there is an initial Poisson structure on it. So there is an initial symplectic geometry that describes symplectic leaves of G star. And in fact, representation theory here, it sort of blends the symplectic geometry of G star and the algebraic properties of that. Um, associative algebra that's sitting over G star. So now the idea of how to construct such R's uh, that would satisfy this modified 
Young Baxter equation is that one should take the universal R matrix for this uh, quantized algebra. I think most of the people either know uh, what this is or heard this name. So it's uh, a certain element in the tensor product of uh, tensor square of UQG that satisfies the Young Baxter equation. It turns out that if you will specialize it at truths of unity, it will start to satisfy this modified Young Baxter equation for R, X, Y, where X and Y are points on the spectrum of this center. So essentially, this is the uh, this is the explanation of why one can construct such invariants. Um, X, okay. You specialize in Q to the roots of unity. Then R is an element of UQ uh, tensor UQ. In each of this UQ, now you have this big center. You pick a point on the spectrum of this center, and you evaluate R universal R matrix in the representation with this fixed infinitesimal character given by these points. And that gives you R. And then it's relatively easy. Well, not relatively easy, but it's a reasonably easy uh, statement uh, that it will satisfy the other uh, modified equation. This was the fact of chiral path. Well, actually, yes. Uh, it's uh, not exactly chiral path, but it's related. There is a uh, there is a famous model in statistical mechanics. Uh, it's probably mostly it's famous because Baxter uh, solved almost all models that are possible to solve. And this is, and this is the only model that he can solve still. Yeah, yeah. That's what? That's what? That's what so, uh, so this is this is a very hard but interesting problem in statistical mechanics model. It's called chiral Post model. And strangely enough, this R is really related to the statistical mechanical model. Now I should finish the talk, and uh, at the end of, the, of this very hazy presentation, uh, I should, well, say a few conjectures about this invariant. There's an invariant of uh, knots, uh, which was uh, invented uh, about seven years ago by Kashaev, uh, whose asymptotics, uh, it depends on the on an integer, and the asymptotics when this integer goes to the infinity becomes the hyperbolic volume of the complement to a node. So this is so-called Kashai hyperbolic invariant. That's, that's a conjecture that his uh, uh, invariant is uh, a special case of this invariant when you choose flat connection to be trivial. Oh, that's a conjecture, yes. It's a conjecture that it grows, yes. He, at several examples, and it's still a conjecture that it has this property. So another conjecture is that uh, this invariant that I was talking about here for SL2 uh, gives uh, his invariant. Uh, conjecture is almost proven. I think uh, there is a fairly good chance that uh, there is a proof of this. Now uh, there are recent paper that. This conjecture is uh, almost done. I don't want to state it as a theorem because there are some bits that should be finished, but uh, I'm almost uh, certain that uh, this is true. That's the basic thing that I've heard that this shows that the quantum variance is going to be on the corollary of the conjecture. Wang knows that. OK. I didn't know this. Um, the other conjecture is the following. There is a paper by Pasiliak and Benedetti about which uh, generalized Kashaev uh, formula and uh, applied it to more general setting. Uh, they obtained invariance of three manifolds with a B flat connection uh, in the, in the uh, uh, manifold. Uh, B is a Borel subgroup of SL2. Now, 
I should say that I don't understand uh, why the invariant uh, depends on the point in the modular space of uh, B flat connections. Uh, the conjecture is that the invariant really depends on the com on the combinatorial data that describe a B flat connection, but it's not gauge invariant. But in fact, what happens is that uh, it describes the SL something that is really invariant with respect to the full SL2 uh, uh, group. So the conjecture is that uh, at least for the case when it's S3 minus L, the, their invariant coincides with uh, our invariant for SL2. Well, then the well less developed uh, conjecture is that it gives an invariant of C manifolds, uh, again, with flat connections for simple uh, uh, complex uh, Lie algebras. And uh, from the point of view of relation to, I mean, from the geometrical point of view, probably would be, I mean, it would be very interesting to understand uh, whether it's really the invariant related to complex chain Simon's topological quantum field theory. And it seems like this is exactly the case, that um, this is a combinatorial realization of this complex chain Simon's uh, theory. So I should finish here.